I'm going to read the little section he has here about nourishing your inner being. I find it kind of, um, it's sweet. I've mentioned this metaphor before, but I think hearing it in his words is worthwhile. He says, in a way, keeping your soul well nourished is like keeping the battery of your smartphone charged. There are certain steps you can take to avoid draining a phone's battery too quickly. For example, when an iPhone has many too many applications running, in the background, the battery runs down faster. So turn off those apps when not using them. In a similar fashion, if you have a lot of unnecessary applications running in the background of your life, these are all the negative thoughts and emotions that are draining your energy, even when you're not consciously engaging with them. As soon as you connect with stillness, silence, and spaciousness, you are effectively turning off these applications and no longer draining your internal battery. And I, I kind of, yeah, I really resonate with that image and this idea we've spoken out about before here of like what's actually going on in the background of our mind. And if we aren't present in our attention and awareness, we don't know. Like we're not even aware. And we live in a time when it's actually pretty easy to have almost no gap that is unfilled with some stimulus, some task, some chore. And so that idea of even though we feel as though we're being really productive, getting a lot of things done, we might be draining and depleting ourselves just because we aren't aware of what's draining us in the background. Does that resemble anyone in this room? Yes. Yeah. And, and that idea of how do you unhook? Because I think for most of us, what leads us to those maybe somewhat compulsive activities of doing and experiencing is we like don't want to feel those things. And we don't how, know how to not feel them, right? It's actually not intuitive. What are we going to do with these, you know, worries? Uh, I have a dear friend uh, who's a mom, and I really, I, I deep bow to all the parents in the world of all time, um, especially mine. I gave them a good run for their money. Just the amount of worry you can entertain as a parent at any given moment. I'm sure there's a lot of parents in the room, right? No matter what age that kid is, like there's always a reservoir of worry you could have kind of running as a background program. And so it's interesting, this turning directly towards and making, you know, this offering of the stillness and silence and the space. And we have to do so, so gently if we're trying to kind of force those background applications that are running, those difficult emotions, we try to force them out of the way, it doesn't work. You know, they kind of bounce back or just doesn't have um, any power, any efficacy to do so. So I think it's so interesting. Again, these, these three precious pills or pathways opening up through the body, the speech and the mind deliberately. And you're not even necessarily saying, okay, now emotions go away at any point, just making that space and making that silence and feeling that openness naturally they're released or as he says, they're shut down. He says also, you need to plug in and charge your smartphone regularly. If you don't, the battery will be depleted and you'll no longer be able to rely on the phone when you need it. In the same way, you need to plug in regularly to the warmth of your inner source and keep your internal battery charged. By resting in the inner refuge, not only are you not draining, you're charging yourself. When your battery stays charged, all the elemental qualities are available to you when you need them. What is magical is that you can be charging your battery even as you are drawing from it. Anytime you face challenges, you can go to the inner refuge where you're charging your battery and feel supported. And again, this is a little bit of a leap of faith. Wow, you moved seats. Kudos, I like that. It's interesting, always, you're always right here. That's good. Good to mix it up. <laughs> Sorry. It's kind of like blowing my mind there. I think it's really, uh, I think it's really 
it's really hard to, to have this sense of, I can go inward as a source of energy. I can go inward as a source of refuge. You know, um, it's very easy for all, for many of us to feel that that refuge comes from being out in the world, being out in nature, maybe browsing records, as we were talking about, being with friends. And all of that indeed can be really supportive. And it's almost, you know, it's like an enhancement to our life in a lot of ways. And it's this richness, but it's a little different than this like inner refuge, than turning inward and that deep rest. I might've mentioned this, but a colleague of mine came out with a paper at the end of the year on deep rest a beautiful paper, um, theoretical paper underlying kind of all the mechanisms around the kind of recovery we get when we do deep rest, which isn't just sleep. Sleep is good, but deep rest activities are things where you're in nature, but you're not like hiking or climbing, like you're just in nature. Maybe forest bathing, that one example we know about, and or you're home, but you're not home on your phone, looking at things, doing things. You're not even maybe reading a book, like you're just there resting. And again, very difficult to imagine doing that for most of us and difficult to do it without agitation, which is why these refuges, why being able to learn this practice of settling the body, speech and mind, so helpful, so aligned with the deep rest opportunity. Um, so yeah, so I think it's I think it's funny that he uses the uh, technology example, but it's kind of relatable. I know that if my phone gets really low, I start to have like, and I'm out in the world, I start to have major anxiety. I'm like, how am I going to do anything? How am I going to be anywhere? Right? We really rely on it. And similarly, when our own inner energy is drained, it's really hard, really hard for us. We can kind of push through and make it for a day or two or a week, but eventually our body collapses, right? And we experience physical pain or burnout or other forms of um, physical illness. There's such a relationship there. So that's his framing. <clears throat> and so for folks who maybe haven't been with us on this journey um, of soul retrieval, that's the practices we've been doing here. There's uh, two phases essentially. And the first phase is settling the body, speech, and mind in their natural states. And this is inviting the body to a state of stillness. And this quality of stillness, you know, even if we just touch into it for a moment, it's the physical aspect of we're not moving anywhere, but it's also this choice aspect of inviting the posture of stillness. As in I'm choosing to bring all my attention and awareness simply to the experience of the body. I'm choosing this inner refuge in which I still myself and my mind through the body. And paradoxically, most of us find that actually there's quite a lot of movement and sensation. And when we do so with all of these preliminary practices of the stillness, it is a way of focusing our attention. It is probably the most valuable single skill capacity that we can do is develop our attention. So... One way to do it, stilling in the body, attending the sensations in the body. And then we move towards this kind of inner silence. And again, that inner silence, it's the choice, no longer engaging with what's happening in the outer world. And that's not only speaking, that's the dialogue we often have ongoing with ourselves and our environment especially like right now I'm working with some housing situations and trying to put all the pieces together of renting and moving maybe and, uh, like, and wow, the mind can get so busy with these kinds of 
simple but important tasks. So we just choose. I'm going to take this inner refuge. I'm just going to find in my speech the invitation to silence. And then this third refuge, kind of all-encompassing refuge, that's his warmth and space. And this is the body, the speech, and the mind, but really mind as in bodhicitta, as in heart. So not only a sense of spaciousness, this kind of infinite open awareness that is the true space of our mind, not just the unbelievable meteor shower of thoughts <laughs> that we experience, but the sky behind that. But there's a warmth there and really kind of cultivating and sensing there's that warmth there, such a refuge. And as we explore these, it might feel elusive at times. It's not a problem. It's a practice. It's a deepening. And again, because it's training attention, every single time we get distracted is, at, is when we are sharpening the blade of attention. So it's not a problem. It's the process of getting more precise so that's our first phase. And then tonight we'll work with actually calling from both earth and water. So we did these elements separately. And these first two, especially in the context of retrieving for inner nourishment, it's a beautiful description he has here. He says, when you're nourishing your soul with earth, there is warmth in the recognition of the earth's element in its qualities of strength and groundedness, solidity and security. Feel the warmth of connection. This will occur naturally as you rest in this space of inner refuge and allow it to emerge. The quality of earth allows its warmth to permeate your body, nourishing your skin, your bones, your blood, your muscles and organs. Every cell of your body resonates with the warmth of this connection. You can feel your inner being nurtured by earth. And so, you know, we've brought to mind these, these places where we can feel that earth element, whether it's on the beach or in the garden or on a mountain. We can really feel that sense of that solidity, that warmth, that holding and invite the quality of that in us. And as I've mentioned before, but I think it's worth mentioning again, this imagining has real causal efficacy. Like it really matters. Bringing to mind these beneficial states, these um, beautiful aspects of the natural world impacts our body the same way bringing to mind the horrors of the world impacts our body. So we're really infusing the mind stream, our thoughts with these qualities and potentials. We could imagine as we did, um, was that just last week? Did we do rejoicing last week? God, it felt like a long time ago. Empathetic joy, yeah. So we could also bring to mind the qualities of someone we really admire, right? And their, their goodness. And that would also saturate the mind stream. But in this case, the natural world, the elements, Juan Gal Rinpoche coming from this, you know, indigenous tradition, more shamanically oriented of Tibetan Buddhism, the natural world plays a very big part. The deities too, but also the elements. And then for water, he said, in nourishing your soul with water, you can notice a sense of comfort, fluidity, and ease. Let a deep sense of comfort pervade your body. As you rest deeply, any blockages naturally release and allow the essence of water element to saturate your mind, your field of energy, your body, any places in your life where you have felt its absence. As you rest in connection with the water element, let the fluidity and comfort nurture you, heal you. So that's a um, little inspiration. So we're gonna go ahead and do this practice together, especially for folks who haven't been here, maybe it's your first time with these teachings. Any, any questions? Yeah. 
Definitely make yourself comfortable. <laughs> Make sure you're paying attention. So giving ourselves a moment to really settle into our space, you know, looking around, whether you're here in the center at home and just feeling really present through knowing and being in the space you are in with the others who are present with you. You even see a little bit outside the time of day. You can almost feel the warmth of the sunlight as it's moving towards setting. And finding a posture that really supports our practice. So it doesn't matter how it looks, really matters how it feels. Supporting a sense of vividness. So that means a sense of wakefulness and clarity, which can be hard this time of day. For folks sitting in their seat, sometimes it can help to scoot up from the back of your chair to sit a little more forward. If you get sleepy or if you feel sleepy, Really feeling that sense of elegant uprightness through the spine. And a soft, gentle openness. Relaxing and releasing through the muscles in the face and the chest and the belly. as motivation and a good reminder we bring forth bodhicitta this desire to wake up for the sake of all beings allowing the heart to feel moved and touched by how great this need is how much struggle and suffering and pain and hurt, how great that need is for more awake beings. And even in our journey towards awakening, we become more and more available through our steadiness, our openness, our strength, our compassion. And just remembering that our practice here it brings us just a bit closer to that aspiration. And it is the fuel of the fire for our practice. And with what hopefully feels at least like a spark of calling to that great need. We let bodhicitta just reside in the body, in the field of the body. As we move our attention to bringing stillness throughout the body.
Let attention and awareness fully saturate the body. And choosing this inner refuge. Feeling the spaciousness of having our attention and awareness in the body. Feeling the whole body and its amazing array of tactile sensations. Without getting too fixated on any of these sensations, just resting in a sense of being home in this body. even with any aches and pains or tiredness. Feel and imagine the supportive refuge of being settled into the stillness of this body. And if the mind gets carried away, as it certainly will, just keep coming back and returning. A couple more moments here, deepening into this mountain-like stillness of the body. The solidity, the firmness, being anchored, our attention and awareness right here in this form body. And in our process of settling inner speech, we can focus a bit more narrowly on the breath. So inviting the inner speech to silence and allowing our mind to fully enter the breath. Noticing the gentle rise and fall And being curious about each breath, that each breath could be just a bit different than the breath before. And for us to fully bring our mindfulness and attention to it, we have to hold that close, curious attention.
part of developing and training our attention is being able to practice introspection. Notice when we're becoming dull and diffuse and recommit to our vividness. Maybe focusing a bit more on the inhale. And if we're feeling excited and the mind is running away, focusing a bit more on the exhale. And whenever we've gotten lost in our thoughts, returning with kindness and gentleness. And once again, attending to the breath, not too tightly, but with this bright, curious attention, allowing our inner speech to settle less and less discursive thinking, narration, and ideas, more and more presence with the body and the breath. couple more moments here to really focus on the breath. And then while still maintaining some sense of awareness with the breath, we expand and open to this warmth. and sense of the mind that is spacious and open. Stillness in the body, silence in the speech, openness and warmth in the mind. Feeling these as our inner refuges of space and light and awareness. It's possible for us to experience a sense of awareness, not only within the body, but also around the body. It's considering and imagining that the boundaries of our awareness may not actually exist, and we can feel awareness around us, permeating us,
A couple more moments here, really checking in, if you can notice, not only the sense of spaciousness, but this light of our awareness, a sense of that vividness and clarity, not a contracted and tight attention, but a open and supple attention and awareness within the body within the mind, within the heart. It needs what my teacher once called an existential relaxation to allow this kind of vividness and clarity to emerge. Then we shift our practice now, moving more to visualization and beginning with a consideration. Is there something which we could really use the support of earth? Something we're having a hard time holding, maybe it feels too much for us. Maybe it feels shaky, not sure. This could be a relationship or something in our work life, family life. Maybe the way that we are working with the news of the world. Just considering if there's something you really could use that grounded support of Earth. And then imagining in the mind's eye a time or a place in which you could really feel that support of the earth. And inviting that quality of warmth, stability, all the way up through the body, through the bones and the muscles, almost as though it could permeate every cell with this solid, stable, warm presence. Allowing whatever needs to be held and unburdened to be completely lifted, supported. Just feeling and imagining this earth element with us, breathing in, feeling that quality of earth element, breathing out, feeling that quality of earth element. Infusing the mind stream with the preciousness and support. A couple more moments here.
receiving this great generosity of the earth. Gently releasing the visualization and bringing to mind an area of your life, maybe it's the same one, where you feel a little stuck or blocked, where you need the fluidity of water. Somewhere you need a sense of comfort and ease from water. And in the mind's eye, once again, bringing to mind an image like a stream or river, a lake. Somewhere we can really see the movement of water. And its capacity for both stillness and fluidity. And invite these qualities here, a sense of comfort and flow, permeating our being, our bones and our muscles into our very cells. Removing these obstacles, creating new flexibility, Feel and imagine retrieving from this essential quality. And feel this very body and its fluidity already compose so much of water. I'm just inviting for a couple more moments the sense of water supporting us. Gently releasing the visualization and coming back to the body and the breath. You feel the simple experience of being present in body and breath. Rejoicing in that homecoming.
Thank you for your practice, everyone. So I would love to hear any questions or reflections on the practice. Any mm, insights or confusion? No? <laughs> okay. Spaced out or hanging out in bliss or somewhere in the middle, maybe? <laughs> I have a question. Folks... Okay, great. Hi there. Hi, I'm Deborah. Um, hi. hi, this is my first time here. And oh, great. Um, I am an irregular meditator. You know, I go, there are times in my life when I am meditating a little bit every day. But when there's been a long gap, and then I sit like this, I start dreaming. And then I know I'm beginning to fall asleep. So I just wonder what that's about. What is happening in my mind, in the mind? Because I'm out of practice, and I think that's what happens. Yeah. Seems like you already know. I mean, I think all of us ruminate. I think you said ruminate, right? Is that what happened? Or... No, it's like I begin, to, I begin to dream. To dream. Oh, the hypnagogic state. Yeah, that's, um, there's a couple different reasons. One could be you're tired, right? It is seven o'clock. I don't know where your time zone is, but it's late. And, um, and so there is that kind of liminal dreamlike space. And then also it, there is kind of this like funny way that it's a little bit like being distracted, but it's the opposite. It's just one other way that we're um, kind of losing attention and clarity. I think the hypnotic state can also be, it can be interesting if we know how to work with dream yoga and we can enter more fully into awareness of the phenomena that are arising because it's, you know, a lot of the dream yoga practices invite us to see all of life as a dream. It's like this moment as a dream, not literally that we're asleep, but most of us are not actually experiencing what's happening in this room. We're experiencing the projections of our mind upon what's happening in this room. Mm -hmm. And so in the hypnagogic state and dream state, we see like phenomena. And when we're asleep, we don't know that they're a dream. But we're in, in between. Sometimes we can notice and bring awareness to that um, that in between state. So you can work with it as a deliberate practice. But generally, and especially if we're tired or as you mentioned, um, not practicing often, it can be a way to fall into dullness. And so you know, kind of getting more upright, even standing, um, can help with it. Even though it is, it's kind of interesting and and workable. But. Yeah, thanks for joining us. How did you uh, how did you find our little community? My cousin is is no. sitting live with you in the room right now. She's Tara. gonna come say hi. I think no. Can you wave? I think you can go right here. There we go. Aww. Yay! Great. Cool. Well, welcome. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please. And if you're in the room, don't mind using the mic so everyone can hear. Um, so I guess using Earth as an element, um, is it help with like uh, anxiety and those types of feelings as well? Oh yeah. Sort of. Yeah. There was like, I watched a really bad movie on War and this. Oh no. And then had some anxiety from multiple things happening on the day and i was like wait okay i feel like i should go do some meditation or something so, yeah 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 uh i think someone at you he watched a bad movie on war yeah. yeah um yeah and so you know one of the ways Angel rinpoche describes the process of retrieving from the elements as i mentioned rather briefly is you know this process of soul retrieval and this idea that a lot of what we 
get stuck into is this identification with the pain body or identification with deficiency, not enough or things aren't okay. And so that is uh, common when we're kind of dispersed in many different places. And that could be through distraction or, you know, other um, things like watching uh, scary programming, but also just like watching the news, scary programming, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, like all this content in which um, we can really engage in that feeling of being totally separate and totally out of control. Right. And, and soul retrieval isn't about changing what's out there. It is really like, what are we hosting any experience from? Are we hosting it from a place of like reactivity or contraction, or are we hosting it from spaciousness, silence, and one? It's the invitation. And it's funny when we uh, we were really fortunate to have Wang Gil Rinpoche visit our Sangha, and I wanted him to talk about this work, and he only talked about the three precious doors. He didn't talk about retrieving from the elements. I don't know if he's like over that. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but they are, they feel like a little different. And I do think especially um, interesting and what he instructs a lot in the book is making friends with the elements too. Right. And so not just going out into nature, but really developing kind of relationality with nature. Okay. And so when you're with earth, really like, oh, what is this like? And what can I have? you know, what can be held here? So I think it's a nice idea. And, you know, we're fortunate in the city, there is a lot of space where we can kind of just do that. There are a lot of opportunities. And then Sky Space will do that next week. But yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to watch. I know, I feel like I can kind of watch nothing except for like cute cat videos now. Like, and the problem is the more you practice, the more sensitive your um subtle body becomes so yeah, weird reactions i was having a conversation that's like the like i had reactions from the animals. yeah there's not a lot of difference in terms of how the nervous system responds to something we're watching on television and something happening to us it's not exactly the same but it's not totally different so we watch these movies and we're kind of putting it's like thinking about what we're putting into our body right like whether it's food or or media like it it runs through our body and impacts it and no yeah it's kind of a bummer but and like i don't know if you've ever had this experience where you remember something but it's not your memory you're remembering a movie yeah and it's, you know, it's like a story that's in your mind. Yeah. You're like, I remember yeah. like, yeah. So it, it gets stored in our memories. And again, it may not feel personal, but for many people, we get so caught up. This is one of the um, subscales on the empathy scale, getting caught up in the narrative of the protagonist or like getting caught up in what's happening in the movie. It's kind of a porousness to others. Um, and I do think they haven't studied this totally, but I do think we become more sensitive when we meditate. However, the like the good um, antidote or forget antidote, just the good balance to that is we're also developing more compassion. So even if we're becoming more sensitive to the, the suffering and the difficulty of the world, we're also becoming more facile at applying compassion to that and being with that. And so in the studies where they have looked at, you know, people's response to difficult imagery before and after, um, sustained meditation practice, they they have this ability to kind of apply compassion, which in psychological terms helps you emotionally regulate. Yeah. So it's not that you don't care, but you care and you're able to hold the care somewhere. Yeah. As opposed to just ignoring and avoiding and being too distracted, um, which I don't know. I think over the long term, we're seeing the the downside of that. So, yeah. Other, yes. Yes, hello. Um, uh, yeah, it was lovely. I, I was a little distracted, but... Um, when you kind of brought it into, you know, I, I think I kind of like perks up out of my, you know, whatever stuff um, with the, 
with talking about like water and needing to be flexible. Like I, I have like, you know, I presented an opportunity um, for my partner to, to do, to, you know, make a decision on whether, you know, I'm going to join her for the weekend or not. Right. And so like that came up during the like water segment and I was like, okay, I, I don't know if I really want to go, but like, it's a, you know, like it's like an opportunity to like move towards, which is like a, I don't know. So it was like, oh, I remember that I need to like think about this and like be open to either, you know, this scenario. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and it was good. Cause I've been, yeah, I've been, I've been watching all the content, but you know, I'm like working, got like live streams of stuff going on all day long. Right. So I'm like fully, fully stimulated, um, from that. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it's like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just like grateful that, uh, I also have other other things to uh, to be concerned about and to be uh, open to and flexible with. So it was a good, yeah, good. <laughs> Snap me, snapped me out of it for a second, right? And then, and then I was right back in. You know, yeah, I mean, and session. <laughs> especially something that has like an emotional charge, like our relationships. If there's like a question or consideration or concern or something like kind of even a little bit wrong our mind is like on it, you know, like on it. Like I saw my friend's dog yesterday with, you know, the um, tennis ball. And it was like, you know, like running down the beach, the tennis ball on oh, the tennis ball. And I was like, I know that. Yeah. Like that total dedication to like this thought, this problem, this thing, you know, like you're so fixated um, and it can be really hard to break out of it. It does seem like the center of the world. And I think for this dog, Ollie, it is the center of the world for sure. Um, but for most of us, it's, it's like, we just get, hooked by something with a little emotional content maybe a little threat maybe a little like maybe it's status maybe it's you know whatever part of our landscape that um feels threatened or maybe it's just an opportunity like oh my god there's nothing more like totally psychotic than falling in love i mean you're like delusional right and you're like non-stop thinking about fantasies of things you don't even know this person you're projecting all over like Right. So the mind can really get so um, stimulated, overstimulated um, and distracted. And, and, you know, some of it's, some of it can be pleasant, but being able to have choice, even like moments of choice is, is what we're looking for. And it's really hard. It's really hard more than ever. I think we are training ourselves in inattention. That's like a lot of the way that we all work and not everyone, but if you're, you know, working with a computer and a phone for some part of the day, you are training in distraction and it's really hard and it's really <clears throat> important and nourishing to like recharge that battery, uh, turn, turn off the apps as Rinpoche would say. So it's, um, it feels more important than ever. It's interesting to really have that capacity and quality and develop it. Any other guest in the back, in the front, please? I'll keep it quick. I had a really weird state that I've never experienced before. Um, for maybe the first half of the meditation, I was experiencing, as usual, the hearing your words, dipping in and out of it, and going back to some thought, and then going back to the... Um, and... Um, I think it was around the time when we transitioned to water, but I had a sudden, it was very sudden, it was almost shocking, but I had a moment where, very similar to the moment where you're about to fall asleep of relaxation. Mm -hmm. And I even had a thought, I was like, oh God, I'm gonna drop my tea. But then, um, and I remember you had asked us to look out for these things in the practice group like six months ago, mm -hmm. like vividness, which is something I almost never feel. Yeah. But it felt like a moment of, I'm about to fall asleep, relaxation, but weirdly completely vivid. And it was just like bleeding and it was super cool. And then I lost it and I spent the entire rest of the meditation going like, what the, what, the, what was that? Yeah. That was cool. Did you feel rejuvenated? Yeah. And then I was like, ah, I want it more. Yeah. Then I was striving. Yeah. And uh, and then you rang the bell. Yeah. That's cool. What was that? Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's also uh, 
in my experience and what I've read, that's also what it feels like when you wake up in a dream. They're like really deep relaxation and also that vividness, clarity. It's pretty wild um, experientially in the body and the mind. And yeah, it is. It's like being able to have relaxation. Most of us don't know that you can be fully relaxed and bright. And so it means you have to have it experientially. And then sometimes you can get there and it really just kind of, it's almost like an engine turning over and that's just where you are. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, often what's described as samadhi and it's, sometimes translated as absorption, but not like absorbed, you know, like, but it's so, um, engaging without trying to be engaging. Cause like the vividness is there without content, right? Cause vividness is free of mental content. You're not thinking, you're not doing, and you're so relaxed and you can go for, I mean, that's why you have people who are able to meditate for hours or days because there's like no efforting and you're not like when's the bell what's happening my knee hurts like it's just like yeah content. without content that makes sense yeah it, it felt like the, the, the entire body awareness at the same time that was yeah that was it yeah exactly all full body awareness at the same time beautiful yeah and who knows what magical mixture allowed it and um once you have a little glimpse of it it can be easier to return but you know, don't don't sweat it too hard if it doesn't return. But it could. Yeah. Great. And I think also, you know, to our conversation last week, you're in the body, right? And like I think this is a tough one for a lot of us who live in the mind and we think meditating's in the mind. And then we like drop in the body and all of a sudden the mind gets bright. You're like, what? <laughs> I was trying to get to the bright mind through the mind, but it's actually through the body. So that's great. Yeah, thanks. Hello. Yeah, I was sitting a bit. Um, yeah, so is this paradox of the human mind, which is like, so starting from the um, you know, phone battery metaphor, like you would expect that when the mind is tired, you kind of have less fuel for the thoughts and to have like less restlessness and rumination something yeah but in, it's exactly the opposite right so if you can talk a bit more about why it's like that. yeah it's a really good question um it's interesting like what is tired i think right and there are and just as i was asking um raf like did it feel energizing because interestingly these like deeper states of awareness are super energizing also, but not in the ruminative, like jangly way where we're like, Arr. like there's just this deep nourishment or rest feeling, which is, um, which is really great. But a lot of our fatigue is um, all the open applications at once. Right. And it's a kind of um, a fatigue of dispersion but not necessarily the kind of fatigue that helps us because to sleep the body, the mind and body, the mind actually has to shut down. And what's interesting is people, it's thought people who are um, intense ruminators and think a lot uh, actually can be some ways very skilled at lucid dreaming because they're used to not being in their body, right? <laughs> Having the mind awake when the body's tired. Um, and so I think the reason that like rumination can keep us awake is it's giving us this little signal over and over, like probably a little like dopagernic signal of like, there's something wrong, there's something wrong, there's something wrong. And that's enough to keep the autonomic nervous system slightly aroused and keep us awake, right? Wait, so what's wrong? Like what's, what's the signal for what's wrong? What's wrong? Fear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like a lot of our rumination at a, at a subtle level is like, something's wrong. I need to fix it. Right. And so that's why like having all those applications. So the ones open in my mind are like this whole housing thing, you know, like always like to low level worry about my dad, you know, low, like all like the world. So if all those are running and occasionally I'm getting a hit, it's like, it's, it's when we are, 
I mean, I don't know if it's the same. It's interesting because when we try to suppress our emotions, they are felt more strongly in the body. So I wonder if when we're kind of like pushing them in the background, there's a little bit of that rebound energy as well. And that low, le like that low level kind of always on with like the worries and the tasks, it just makes it very hard to fall into that kind of in the contemplative traditions, like that bliss of blamelessness, right? Where you feel like I've done everything I need to do and I can lay down and be at ease. And then from the kind of psych contemporary psychological point of view, you're, you know, you just have so many different tasks. You're switching from back and forth and back and forth, even though it's at one level exhausting. It's also like, there's this kind of like that hit over and over that kind of threat to hit that makes the body kind of liven up. So why is that not when, when fully rested? Like when the mind is like, when you're like fully and deeply rested, why these don't show up and they only show up when you're like, your mind is tired. And yeah. Life because it, it has to do, I think a little bit, it's a really good question. I think it has to do with like the relationship with emotion and sleep. So often when we are low on sleep, we are higher in emotionality more reactive so you probably noticed this right if you're not sleeping well and anything mundane happens you're like very pissed and so probably at that low level when you're um, a little bit tired even the small background thoughts have more weight and energy you're getting like more triggered in the background so it's not that you feel them it's more like you don't have the power to keep them away or something yeah and again like how we how we like hold our emotions is so important and a lot of you know our strategies for holding emotions well is is awareness like okay i'm feeling pretty anxious about the world right now or pretty worried about my moving situation and that like conscious awareness but when you're not aware of them and they're kind of suppressed in the background that's a it's like much more taxing on the body and I think awareness is harder when we're tired. You know, we're in the emotion. We're not like seeing the emotion. Good questions. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I was doing this thing that um, I didn't really like mean to do. It was sort of like... It's one of those things that just like spontaneously came, oh, like should do this um, during the, the practice. Well, my practice this morning had a little bit of it. Anyway, um, I've been doing this, like, I guess we'll call it parts work. Mm -hmm. And in my practice sort of making contact with certain parts of me, in certain times, places, and ages that aren't the present and trying to repair. And um, like, and so today, it's sort of like just spontaneously arose, mm -hmm. like in the earth practice, like it was this melding of like, you know, visualizing my experience when I was doing like a walking meditation the other day out on this trail and where, my balance was very like I was noticing my balance right mm -hmm. and all this and the feeling of the earth supporting and you know all of that and then sort of leaping into this other part of me at another time and place and age mm -hmm. and then experiencing that through that part of me that person at that time and place mm -hmm. It was like time travel and then s s getting the earth energy in that moment mm. when that, I don't know if there is a, I know that sounds, maybe it's just my weird brain no. or is there a history? Is this a thing in Buddhism at all? Like, are, is there any form of this sort of like hurts work or, and I think also, you know, it has a lot to do with trauma, you know, like otherwise I wouldn't be doing that. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so the older part was able to experience you now in like being grounded on the earth. Is that 
like I jumped into the Mia before and did the practice. That's so cool. tonight, like just now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because the only research that I've done or seen on that is more from psychedelics, right? So autobiographical time travel, that's like a code. We've done some of this. <laughs> it's, it's like a, it's a code we created to analyze research data on like what's the transformative process of compassion for people recovering from trauma. So there is, you know, and there are some very similar like neural mechanisms going on in um, psychedelic, certain psychedelics and certain meditation practices. And kind of one of the main clusters is probably like the decentering and the denarratizing, essentially giving you a little bit of distance from this present moment, who you are now, what you're thinking, all the narrative, all the dream we dream all day of like, this is who I am and this is what I do. And these are the people I see. And like, we are living in this like really constructed narrative. And when that gets a little loose, all these other narratives are there. Like this one's just the one we're doing now. Remember our narrative last year? Nope. Cause we're in this one. <laughs> right. And so, and again, I've said this, but I just love Matthew Brunsilver said that meditation is like a disorganized exposure therapy. At some point, everything comes up, right? And I think that's true. So that's, you know, I don't see the research on it, but I do see it in psychedelics. So it makes me think there's some kind of similar processes going on where a little bit of the loosening of identification with this self, this moment, this story, it kind of allows all those other parts of us that live in us, right? And there are, um, we are the accumulation of so many stories, some that we lived, some that were put onto us, um, and how to, you know, the past, like that famous quote, the past isn't the past, right? We are living in this moment, the accumulation of our past actions, behaviors, and memories. And so to, you know, the word in, in Buddhism would be to like purify that. And so you definitely talk about kind of purifying these afflictive tendencies of emotion and, and behaviors and, and more like habitual karmic tendencies, not per se that I've read as much on specific um, events in the past, but I wouldn't be surprised, um, meaning that there would be some really specific practice for releasing a certain kind of harm in the past. But so much of the constellation of these practices is about that purification Right, so bringing for, especially in Vajrayana, not in not in every tradition, bringing forward that difficult material in order for it to be self liberated through your spacious awareness. So thanks. Well, this was something that I've like a couple of years ago said that I needed to do was to go back into my timeline and like somehow heal these parts of me. So it's something I've been working. Right. So there's on, intention. But this was a good way to do it, which which was to go back to that point in time as myself and and get healed by the earth With energy, the earth. like in that yeah. way. Yeah. Beautiful. It was effective. Thank you. Inspiring. Man, everybody's really killing it today. Don't worry if you fell asleep in practice or it's groggy. Don't listen to these two, you know, no problem. <laughs> anything, anything is good. But it is really inspiring to hear, um, yeah, people's practice and, and what happens and how it unfolds. I think it's, it's really enriching for all of us. Okay, so I want to share a little bit about... Um, some other ways that we can um, nourish ourselves, nourishing our inner body. There's a part, it's a part, it's so obvious, but it just, it struck me so hard. Um, you know, he talks about charging the battery and he has these different sections of this chapter of how do we nourish ourselves at a deep level. And when I just saw the heading for this, I felt so uh, moved, which is said, it's called having trust. He says, security and connectedness are present even in the rockiest moments. Ease and comfort are available to you in the most uncomfortable circumstances. Bliss, freedom, flexibility, and openness, the elemental qualities are always available. The question is, can you trust that they are available and can you access them? When you're feeling a lot of pain, can you trust that you can close your eyes, connect with space within, and feel a glimmer of comfort? 
once you find that comfort, can you be with it? Can you breathe into that feeling and stay with it longer? It's human nature to dwell on our problems, but if you can become a little more familiar with positive qualities, the next time you face a challenge, you'll have a different response. You'll know where to turn and you'll know, and you will trust the support within you. And uh, yeah, it really, I think it's really hard to have trust um, for outer circumstances and for inner circumstances to be supportive for us. And I just thought it was so beautiful, this invitation to not only, you know, try out these practices and, and connect with them. And for some of us in this room, we've been practicing them for a number of months now. Like, do, do some people feel like trust in these practices? Yeah, that's, it's great. You know, that's, and it's not just enough, you know, to, to have it, but to really, you know, kind of feel that spiritual confidence of, wow, that's here with me. That's here for me. Um, Cause I think this lack of trust is so end endemic, um, really not feeling, you know, the stability and safety. And it's very hard for us to like, develop along the path and, you know, develop in relationship if we don't have that fundamental trust or safety. And often we're looking for it from the world or the other person. Sometimes they have it <laughs> and sometimes they have it in a consistent way, but often, you know, it's really that establishing that deep trust within ourselves. We don't want to, I'm not saying we should be with someone who we don't find trustworthy, but it's really helpful to have the compliment of feeling that our own being, our own self, our inner world is that source of trust and safety. And really appreciated him highlighting that. And he also, um, he really, uh, I appreciate, he gets pretty s strong on, we also need to change our habits. Like if you want to nourish your inner life and your inner world, you don't just get to kind of pile on new fun practices on top of your, you know, messy ones, <laughs> right? You know, like clean house, right? You got to like change some things. And that can be really, you know, it can be really tough. And he says, you know, there's uh, like our, our familiar habitual responses that we often get stuck in, he says, is when our full-blown pain body is activated. Uh, his example is you commute, you go to work, you assume your professional identity, you confront the frenetic energy of a full schedule. Um, you haven't taken any action uh, to feel dragged down physically, emotionally, and mentally but your alarm clock, the commute, and the workplace have done this for you. They only drain you because you allow them to, because you think it's normal to experience Monday morning in this way. For some people, that extends to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You can spend all weekend even worrying about the week ahead. And so this idea that like part of our habitual spots is like, oh, like I hate my job or my relationship's hard. And we create a story about it on top of the experience itself, right? Just that expectation and identification with the pain um, and getting lost in what isn't working. And he says another very common habitual response is our unacknowledged expectations of friends, coworkers, and family. No, I can't believe they did that. Um, that if you're if you're having that frame of mind, you're allowing pain to interfere with your life. You're spending personal time activating emotions that drain your energy and block access to your elemental essences, and essentially like cut it out, right? And what's really interesting, like stop, right? You you don't really need a lot of explanation. And, you know, his other examples are, this is terrible. What am I going to do? Um, and just that kind of energizing those difficult emotions. And one thing I was really thinking about in the context of this inner nourishment, is we really need to, um, we really need to have pretty good introspection to be able to take care of ourselves. If we don't know what we're feeling, what thoughts we're endorsing and energizing, 
it's going to be really tough for us to take reparative action or to cut it out. Like we really, you know, we need to be pretty attuned and pretty aware of our experience in order to do that, which it's kind of, uh, it's a virtuous cycle there of developing that mindfulness and that awareness of what is the contents of our mind? What are these projections that we're experiencing? Um, yeah, and then he, he gets into, which is interesting, um, how our inner practice supports our physical healing. Uh, I wonder if some of you might remember from when he presented in person, just this beautiful concept he brought forward that the body is always in the process of healing itself. And really, we just need to remove the blockages to that healing. And sometimes the blockages are like our lack of access to these these fundamental qualities with the warmth and stillness and silence. Um, so I appreciated that from him. And he says, <laughs> yeah, he gave this little, I mean, many of you who are familiar with traditional Chinese medicine or, or other practices will know this, but he says the internal elements themselves are associated with various organs. The earth element is associated with the spleen, the water element with the kidneys, the fire element with the liver, the air element with the lungs, and the space element with the heart. As the elements come into balance within us, they sustain a full healthy functioning of all these essential ills. Oh, sorry, the essential organs. And I think it's interesting. Um, there's this idea, you know, that he talks about that in the ancient Buddhist scriptures, they describe primordial awareness. So this kind of clear, open, clear light awareness as the medicine for treating and healing pain and disease. And most people assume that that's the pain and disease coming from our emotional states. And, you know, what uh, Rinpoche says here is, no, no, really, physical pain and disease, right? And you do, do see more and more research in this area of looking at how contemplative practices, including meditation, but also Tai Chi and um, many other forms of practice, literally physically heal the body and nourish the body. It's not that surprising. Um, so many of us know that stress has a bigger impact on our physical health and well-being than, you know, many other of our general behaviors. So it's stress, right, is is mental weight that's caused by over arousal of emotions. And that intensity of our emotions, it's directly connected to our physical health and well-being. And it's another way, I think, I think he brings it up in this in this part of the book to really encourage us and get us excited and motivated. Figure like if you aren't excited by the last chapter, I don't know, like you probably wouldn't have finished the book. But just this, you know, really important um, aspect of how these practices can heal us. And, you know, this idea that he says almost all of our practices are some way that we can connect to the true nature of mind. In so many Buddhist texts, you hear like a, some version of a koan or question of what is the true nature of mind? That's the essential question. What is the true nature of mind? And it's very hard to describe. It's definitely hard to teach, hard to experience, but to start to be really in love with that question, like not just, I don't know, true nature of mind. I don't like worry, rumination, dullness, right? But to be very curious about that, you know, is the true nature of mind warmth and openness? And there's some beautiful... Um, in kind of playful ways, you'll hear teachers, you know, ancient teachers, especially like, what color is the mind? What shape is the mind? You know, if it had a texture. And so this curiosity and openness and that getting to that fundamental question, um, he's saying there's a connection that when we practice with pain and disease or anything that interferes with our open awareness, uh, we do so to become more familiar with the inner refuge and stabilize our experience in it. And through familiarity, we heal our soul. Physical healing, when it occurs, is a welcome byproduct. So even though this familiarization with our true nature of mind, it's not in order to heal the physical body, it ends up doing so. 
And so the main goal, really familiarizing and being curious about that nature of mind. Um, and he says, the more we practice opening our attention and hosting the pain rather than contracting around it, the stronger this expansive sense of self becomes. And so next week, we'll talk a little bit more his kind of um, his his like end of his chapter here, which is so great, is really talking about how our identification with ourself is the primary producer of our pain and how we continue to loosen that not very helpful tendency to feel our separateness and especially our deficiency and how these refuges really support that. Especially our, our uh, separateness, and deficiency. Yeah, deficiency. I'm sorry. Oh, deficiency. Deficiency. Yeah, deficiency. Yeah, you just don't want to hear it. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It's a hard teaching. I'm not into it either. Um, so I, I keep meeting it over and over. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I do think I, um, I'm on a little bit of a, uh, I guess you could call it like a, a cleanse at this moment. I'm working with a, a beautiful teacher who invites um, connecting with a different plant. Some people might remember I did this with yarrow a couple of years back and I'm working uh, with rose right now and it's really strict and annoying. Like I can eat like brown rice and yams um, and I like that, but it that invitation, <laughs> but I don't like it all day. <laughs> it's super boring. Um, but that invitation to turn inward it has just been pretty astounding, even in these first four days, um, how much you really get to see, or I've gotten to see, where the identification with deficiency pops up. You know, and in this case, I don't get to listen to my precious podcasts. I'm not doing music. Like I'm just kind of pulling in a lot of things, and I, I just. Uh, don't recommend doing this all the time, but I do think it is, it's so great to give ourselves these moments where we, we try to almost intensify and see the pain of our everyday reality and thinking as motivation to kind of commit to the path a little deeper. Cause it can be like, though it's awkward, kind of samsara kind of works and can feel comfortable. And so when you like remove some of those comforts and, you know, really give yourself the space to be with yourself, it's very motivating. So I'll be doing that the next three weeks. You'll see that motivation unfold. Very exciting. Next week though, I get to have nuts again. Yes. I'm really excited for that. Uh, but on that note, let's dedicate the merit of our energy and practice together. So really, as everyone naturally did, connecting with the breath and the body, feel that homecoming to this fundamental inner refuge. And if it feels comfortable and natural, placing the hands in front of the chest and symbolic gesture of offering considering any of the attention, intention, and energy that we've gathered here tonight. May we radiate this out in great waves that all beings could be happy, know the causes of happiness. All beings could be free from suffering. All beings could know belonging and love. And that all and every being could be free.